I'm AJ Jacobs, and you are watching Mr. Media. Is that what you want? Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to TV screenwriter David Mish. He's the author of a new history called Funny, the book. Stick around. This has the potential to be funny, the interview. Or not. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of old Jewish comedians huddled together by cartoonist Drew Friedman in the new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. They always say that a joke won't be funny if you try to dissect or explain it. But that's not the case if your task is exploring the entire history of what's funny. History, as we all know from high school, is not usually very funny, but author David Misch has found a way in Funny the Book. Funny the Book is a masterful primer on the origins of human comedy from the earliest days of recorded time through the development of silent movies, radio, television, cable, and the internet. There are plenty of asides with smirk and snark so that the facts never get in the way of the funny. As for the author, you've probably seen David Misch's TV work over the years. He won an Emmy Award for Best New Comedy Series as a writer on Mork and Mindy, starring Robin Williams, and was executive producer of the animated series Duckman, which featured Jason Alexander. There he is. There's Duckman. That would, talk about snark. Go back and <laughs> find Duckman yeah. somewhere. Um, Jason Alexander from Seinfeld was uh, the, lead, the lead voice on that show. Now, more recently, uh, Mish teaches uh, musical satire at UCLA, and a course called Practical Foundations of Comedy at USC. And on September 24th, he will moderate a panel on humor at the California Women's Conference featuring Judy Carter and Jerry Jewell. David Mish, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you so much. Duckman, I gotta tell you, I, uh, I delayed starting the interview a minute because I was desperately trying to find, I have the original press kit in my garage for Duckman. Wow. And I wanted to bring it in and, and hold it up. I, uh, uh, when, oh, he's going to find it. When Duckman uh, first came on, oh, they, hey, Duckman, dude. <laughs> <laughs> when Duckman first came on, Mr. Media, this was, uh, I'm thinking, the mid 90s, right? 93. Okay. And it was on for several seasons. Four. Four seasons. Uh, yeah. Mr. Media was a uh, weekly newspaper, uh, syndicated newspaper column. I remember newspapers. Uh, vaguely, yeah. yeah, it's you know, uh, and I had tried to, uh, to 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 get someone from the show to come on and uh, be interviewed, and I could never get anyone. They kept sending me all the press kits, but I could never <laughs> get anyone to actually be uh, be I'm interviewed. Sorry, yeah. I apologize. Uh, Eighteen years later. Well, thank you. It's it's a long <laughs> time coming, but I, I do appreciate it. Uh, so anyway, I I I, I really like Duckman. So yeah, it was it was actually. Uh, great fun writing. Uh, two of my good friends, Jeff Reno and Ron Osborne, who were really the creative force behind the show, they had written for uh, West Wing and Moonlighting, and they agreed with me that this was by far the most fun writing job we ever had, because in animation, you can really go further than you can almost in any other form. And in Jason Alexander, we got a guy whose talents were more or less limitless. I mean, from Seinfeld, you barely barely scratching the surface. He's a song and dance man. He can do any kind of voice. And Reno and Osborne loved uh, His Girl Friday is their favorite movie, and screwball comedy is their genre. So the whole idea was to make it as fast-paced as possible. And Jason could do it. Most of the other actors couldn't. And we told the editor to take out any breaths that any actor took between words. We wanted no breaths at all. Wow. So it was really fast. The secret behind the series, right there. <laughs> no breathing. <laughs> it's the secret of great comedy. Uh, and, uh, you, you have a great joke, then you die. 
Well, and that well, show, it was it was just funny. It was like packed with laughs. It was nonstop. You could actually come away from that show being kind of exhausted, trying to trying to keep up with everything being thrown at you. Yes. Well, actually, in season season four, I re I, I took over the show and I reinstituted breathing. I said we had gotten too many letters and calls from people saying, "I love the show, but I'm getting like a third of it." And I thought let's <laughs> up that percentage a little. <laughs> and that was uh, that show was. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to say it was inspired by, but it followed in the footsteps of The Simpsons, really, which was the real was a real snarky and, and something totally unlike prime uh, prime time uh, a- animated comedy. Uh, oh, absolutely! But you know, first of all, The Simpsons is the best. Uh, we would we idolized The Simpsons, but it was very different. It was really following in the footsteps which were coming behind us of South Park. Because yeah. Duckman was really evil. He was a horrible, horrible <laughs> duck. He was racist, sexist, every other is you could mention. And the show itself just was really foul in both senses of the word, if I must. Um, and we sort of felt South Park was stealing our thunder, and uh, they did successfully. <laughs> but what the hell, we had a good run, and we were happy. We got two Emmy nominations, so that's something. So it was four seasons. How many episodes were done? 70 episodes. Oh, is it, is it in repeats anywhere? I never see it. Uh, no, it was on Comedy Central for a while, but it was very late at night, and no one else has picked it up. It's difficult to program. Really, there, the Comedy Central is one of the few places that could, even now, you know, 15, 20 years later, uh, it's, it's really evil. <laughs> <laughs> we one, uh, we, can I say dirty words? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So we, um, uh, we recorded in a place uh, in Hollywood, and next door to us was a uh, school. And one day we noticed Ice-T picking up his kid outside the school and said, you want to do a voice? Hmm. So we brought him in for a parody we did of um, black exploitation movies, 70s black exploitation movies, and he played an angry black revolutionary. And he had a 30-second speech, which we counted had 33 motherfuckers in it. Now, we bleeped them, so all you heard was motherfucker. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but afterwards, he paid us such a high compliment. He said, "You know, that's a little rough, even for me." <laughs> so we thought, "Yes." <laughs> <laughs> he made iced tea uncomfortable. Yeah, <laughs> uncomfortable with obscenity. <laughs> Not bad. Not bad at all. Uh, and right next to a school. How sweet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he didn't speak too loudly. Well, yeah, I understand. I understand. That's what uh, you know. The padding on the walls is for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, well, let's talk about your book, uh, Funny, the book. Is it is it a kind of a slippery slope trying to explain even the origins of comedy, let alone a joke itself? Well, uh, the, the, let's go back to what you said at the top of the show, which is, you know, the old saw about dissecting comedy, killing it. <clears throat> My response to that is, or dissecting a joke, killing it. To me, the answer to that is tell the joke first, and then you haven't killed it, and then explain it if they're interested uh, I always find dissection to be fascinating. Uh, from a very early age, I thought, how did they do that? And this book is essentially, how did they do that? I examine not just the history, but the psychology, philosophy, as you know, the anthropology, the biology. There's a section on humor and, uh, and uh, uh, sickness and health. And even the theology of humor. I have a theory in the last chapter about how comedy is essentially God. And I know that won't offend anyone. No, um, no. So... <laughs> Dissecting is, to me, increasing your enjoyment of something. And the whole premise of the book is that drama always gets the headlines and the awards. Comedy, because we're laughing, seems like the poor stepsister. It's like, oh, anyone can do comedy. I I make people laugh at work. But in fact, I think it's as difficult, as challenging, and as rewarding as any art form. And i got to ask you, because I know that you just got back from a trip to Israel. How did... uh you know, I'm, I'm sure that you tried out that whole comedy is God thing over there. How did that go over? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I went to the Wailing Wall and tried that out, and a few people, and you know, I, I felt some tension. <laughs> I think it's not Hebrew is that good. That's the only explanation I can come up with. It must be the room, you know. <laughs> yeah, tough room. Try to do, yeah, I try to do comedy in certain rooms. You know, maybe yeah. the ceiling is too high, the ceiling is too low. Well, you know? trust me, Wailing Wall, tough room. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> I'm also thinking, obviously, you'd have to do some research for this. It didn't just come from your font of uh, personal knowledge. Did you, did you run across a, a lot of books that try to explain uh, humor and comedy in a serious way, which I always find ridiculous? 
Yeah, I did. And, it, you know, I have sympathy for them because it's an it's a important subject and it's worth exploring. But there's this inherent, you know, dichotomy between what you're talking about and how you're talking about it, which, you know, as you say, ends up seeming ludicrous. And I tried to beat that. And I don't know if any other books have tried to do this by being trying, trying to be funny about the serious questions of comedy. Uh, so hopefully it's a spoonful of sugar that helps the medicine go down. The, I did a huge amount of research. I had no idea how much I was going to end up doing. Thank you, Mr. Internet. That's a, it really paid off. But uh, I knew a lot. You're welcome, uh, David. <laughs> I knew a lot, and only by getting into it did I discover how much more there was to learn. And there are fascinating factoids uh, sprinkled throughout the book, fascinating to me anyway. For instance, uh, I was looking in the Commedia dell'arte, which is the medieval form of comedy, Using, uh, with actors using just a few props traveling from town to town, which is still in use today. And it's where Punch and Judy came from. And um, I discovered that uh, they would use a uh, stick to hit one another and, uh, for comic effect, and they'd fall down. And the stick had to make a loud sound, and it was called the Batachio, and the translation of that is slapstick. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, it's so that's where that comes from. I had no idea. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I asked you about the, the serious books about comedy because I was, I was remembering being a kid in high school a long time ago <laughs> and, and being real interested in this. Uh, I, was a, uh, I was a big fan. My grandfather had gotten me hooked in the 70s on old-time radio. It would be rebroadcast on sun, Saturday and Sunday afternoons. The station in New York would have it. And I listened to that stuff, and that got me interested in learning more about comedy and humor. And I would pick up, you know, the, the school library or the public library would have these books about humor and comedy. And you pick them up, and it'd be like, but this isn't funny. <laughs> you know, it's just like, how can, you, how can you explain comedy without being funny? And, I mean, in your book, um, you do things like, you know, well, there is no chapter 14. And it's yes. too late to get your money back, okay? <laughs> you footnote yourself from the page before. I mean, yeah. you know, it's done. You know, if, you, if someone's reading this book and they're starting to get a little, they're f feeling like maybe there's just a little too much history and it's starting to drag a little bit, suddenly there's, there's, a, there's some, I, well, I don't want to call it slapstick, but there's, there's something funny. It, it drops off the face of the earth for a second. It just, you know, and that's the way a book of explaining comedy should be, just like a book... If you did a book on drama, you know, it should be lots of to be or not. You know, I mean, it, it should reflect what it is. It shouldn't, it shouldn't all be, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ph.D. level. Yeah, I think, you know, when scientists uh, deal with comedy, it, it ends up being very dry and something anyone who's genuinely interested in comedy isn't going isn't gonna to look at. Um, the, uh, uh, the footnotes, uh, you know, were great fun. I actually, the, the production uh, team at the book actually got one of them wrong. There was supposed to be a footnote that itself had a footnote. Uh, and the footnote for the footnote was about how footnotes are really boring. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, there, I do a lot of that. But, you know, the other thing is this book isn't just history, as I mentioned before, and I also have chapters, which, by the way, if you look really closely, and no one ever will, uh, are less funny than the other chapters. They're the chapters that are actually about comedians. So I sort of stand back and let the comedians do the work. There's uh, Woody Allen, Steve Martin, Buster Keaton, the Marx Brothers, and I try and figure out, you know, what made them so damn funny. Uh, I was the host for the Mork and Mindy uh, TV tapings when I was there the first two years of the show. And uh, <laughs> mostly the hosts were there to be really funny and keep the audience entertained. I was hosting for Robin Williams, <laughs> so I was never funny. <laughs> I, I just said, here's the scene, folks. I never tried to compete. Because I would have lost. <laughs> you know, I, I remember seeing him uh, in concert in the 70s and seeing Steve Martin. It, and the Steve Martin story was, came, was the one that came to mind. I saw Steve Martin the week after he had done the Wild and Crazy Guy sketch with Dan Oh, Howard. the uh, the brothers. The, uh, I've forgotten their names on Saturday Night Live. Right, right. yeah. yeah. And it, was the, I, it, was the following, it was the following Saturday. He'd done it on Saturday, and then I saw him like the next Thursday, Friday or Saturday or something. At the uh, the Rutgers uh, University Fieldhouse, I think it was called, and uh, I felt so bad. He had an opening act. It was a singer. It was Steve. Um, it was a very accomplished uh, singer songwriter. Oh, I know that. Oh, 
I can't think of his name, but I know who you mean. The guy passed away a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I had never heard of him. You know, I was like 16, 17 probably, because I, I think I probably drove there with a date. And uh, I remember thinking, oh, what a horrible thing to be the guy who's opening for Steve Martin. Even, even as young as I was then, I had a real sense of empathy for this guy because he got booed off the stage. Yeah. And years later, I found out who it was, and, I, and it was like, wow, that's a, yeah. I mean, that's a real that? talented guy. But nobody cared. And you, you didn't, it, it better to be the singer opening for Steve Martin or Robin Williams than to be a comedian opening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And by the way, there's a famous comedy story about that. That incident that you just described is payback because... Uh, Albert Brooks described being uh, in the position most comics were before Steve Martin and Robin Williams became headliners who could fill stadiums, which was they were the opening acts often for rock groups. So Albert Brooks told a story about opening for Richie Havens, and the audience was booing and about to attack him and everything, and then he said, I had this brilliant idea. I said, fuck. And suddenly they're in, they love me. They're <laughs> women throwing their shirts at me. They're hoisting me on their shoulders. So... <laughs> well, and, you finally don't have to scramble as much. And that other, the other famous example of that, I think the, one of the most famous was Jimi Hendrix opening for the Monkees. Oh my God! Yeah, I heard about that, but I forgot. That's so funny. Yeah. And not I mean, doing well. I'm sorry. Not doing well. Uh, not doing well. Yeah. Not oh, uh, you know not uh, not doing well. And yeah, you know, the Monkees were were talented enough and and savvy enough that they knew what they had in front of them. But you know what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. The audience wasn't. Yeah, no, no. So, uh, what got you started on this book? Was it you're teaching these classes now? Was this to to go along with the class, or was this just? Yeah, like... I, I had I, I did a, a course at USC called uh, the Practical Fundamentals of Comedy. Uh, it has to have the word practical in it because students won't take a class unless they know it will get practical. them work. <laughs> uh, so uh, that was fifteen three hour sessions. So I had a lot of research to do. And uh, after doing it, uh, I mentioned it to a literary agent friend of mine, and she said, that sounds great. Why don't you write a book out of it? So I had to change it considerably. I left out 42 hours, and, and I made it a little funnier because you don't want a, an actual academic class to be a stand-up routine. Although afterwards, one of the kids genially accused me of that. But, um, it, yeah, so it came out of uh, research for a class, and... Basically, I found a lot of academic things that were great for people to learn, but then sprinkled among them, I found all these fascinating things that anyone would be interested in, and that's where what I took for the book. And what was the most surprising thing you learned in your research that you hadn't expected? Hmm. Well, I guess, um, you know, I'm not sure I was literally surprised by anything, but I was impressed uh, by that my own premise had been fulfilled to the degree that there was a long and glorious history to comedy, and that it played an important role that people have not really recognized, I feel, in a, in a good enough way. Uh, for instance, I mentioned that the, first, uh, the, for the job description for the first stand-up comic was court jester. That's what court jesters were. And the origin of the court jester, which was uh, at least according to history, and we must believe history, is that a, 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 a slave was brought to the pharaoh's court, and he was sort of, he didn't know what to do. He was bumbling around and falling into things and saying dumb things, and everyone thought that was hilarious, and they made him the first court jester. Uh, so that history is uh, kind of cool. And then for another thing I was fascinated by, and it comes out of that, is the origin of the Joker in the deck of cards. It is a court jester. That's what the Joker is. And if you think about it, the Joker is the one crazy card. He's literally wild. And uh, there, there's a direct connection between that and comedy. And then the other major thing, uh, which I think you, you read about too, was Trickster, which is this mythological character, which is a fundamental archetype of, the, of, the, of humanity. Uh, Carl Jung uh, 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 refers to him. And Trickster is a, a character who uh, appears in every human culture and uh, always uh, the, the, he's like the contemporary comedian. He's the uh, upender of social convention and the uh, uh, button pusher, uh, the troublemaker. And he does this through all sorts of methods that essentially translate to modern comedy, duping and insulting the powerful, con games, practical jokes, but most of all through playing with words. Uh, puns, double entendres, malapropisms, tongue twisters, oxymorons. These are all trickster things which... We use every day. Now, I, I want to jump ahead uh, because a lot of comedy to, to cover and you know, a, a limited uh, a limited amount of time, even here in, in the internet world of Mr. Media. Um, 
uh, you cover the entire 20th century, roughly, in terms of the, the genres of comedy. Uh, I mentioned silent film and radio and TV, cable. Um, do you have a favorite of, of, uh, of the last hundred years, a, a type of comedy, a, you know, the way it's been presented? or? I'm sort of Catholic, so to speak, in that regard. I, I love all of it. Uh, you know, the minute I start thinking, oh, this is my favorite, other examples pop into my head. But I must say I sort of lean towards screwball comedy of the 30s and 40s, a time when women sort of competed toe-to-toe with men, when dialogue was all important, and when rapid-fire dialogue was treasured. In fact, uh, there's a movie, His Girl Friday, which is considered the classic screwball comedy, and evidently, according to Cary Grant, the star, and Rosalind Russell, the co-star, the only direction that the director, Howard Hawks, gave them was faster. <laughs> they do a scene and they'd say, faster. And if you see the movie, it just blows your mind. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible, even if you're not in a theater with people laughing, to keep up with what's being said. And I love it. <laughs> I love it when comedy challenges the listener, when you really have to lean forward to keep up. I was thinking of The Thin Man uh, in that regard. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Very snappy patter and, you know. <clears throat> William Powell, I think, is one of the uh, unrecognized greats of comedy. He, uh, and he did comedy and drama, as did Cary Grant. But, geez, he was great in, uh, in his movies. Just an indelible persona, which, of course, Don Adams stole for the TV series Get Smart. He was very upfront saying he was doing a William Powell Thin Man impression. And he made it his own over time. Yeah, I think, he did. I think it's safe Absolutely. to say. Yeah, I think that's what I think. You're, the way you describe the screwball comedies is uh, the same way I would I would explain my love of uh, the '40s radio shows, uh, <laughs> Fever McGee and Molly, and uh, Jack Benny, and uh, yeah. uh, the great. I got Congress one story League. there. I'm sorry. I got a story there. Oh, please. So you know the most famous radio joke of all time, which was Jack Benny's. So that he's walking a late. First of all, for those of you who don't know, which is what 98 percent. Of the listening audience, Jack Benny was a great comic of the 20th century, and uh, his he had a few personas, but the most uh, uh, prominent one was Cheapskate. He he lost a dollar bill, went to the police station, uh, and they asked him to describe it, and he recited the serial number. Uh, so uh, he's walking late at night, and a robber comes up to him and says, um, "Your money or your life?" And there's a pause, and he says, "I said, your money or your life." And there's another pause, and Benny says, I'm thinking it over. <laughs> now, this is legendary as the biggest, longest laugh in radio history, <clears throat> and research has been done, and it's not true. In fact, it's not even the longest laugh on Benny's show, and it's not even the longest laugh that Benny got. Hmm. But uh, it's so perfect. It's the perfect joke because I'm thinking it over is four words that aren't funny. It's funny only in context, and I use right. it in the book to show how the comic's persona is so much more important than the words. There's a famous story about Bob Hope that he told a, story, uh, told a uh, joke about an elevator in England, and the guy who wrote the joke, the famous comedy writer Larry Gelbart, was there with a British date, and he said, everyone just laughed, but I just realized, and I wrote the joke. He, he said, elevator, and you don't call them that here. You call them lifts. lifts. <laughs> yeah, so why did, the, why did you laugh? And she said, well, it's Bob Hope, and he's funny. But getting back to Jack Benny, the fun story behind that is the, st the story of the writers who wrote the joke. They're in the room, and uh, they come up with this setup that <clears throat> Benny's going to be robbed, and they know it's gold. They know there's a great line there, but they can't find the line. And they're, one of them's pacing, the other one's sitting on the sofa. The guy who's pacing is coming up with line after line, and they're not working. And finally, he says to the guy sitting on the sofa, well, why don't you come up with something? And he says, I'm thinking it over. <laughs> and that's how... They thought of this, and they realized that was the line for Ben. That's great. Well, and I got I got to ask you before we run out of time about writing for Mork and Mindy and writing for Robin Williams. Uh, it, there's there's a chapter about it in the book, and uh, uh, you know much has been said and written about Robin over the years, and you know he's never. You know I I've never interviewed him, so I don't want to say I, I've heard this directly, but you've always had the impression in the public that uh, Robin. Robin gave the impression that he wrote his material that he you know i'm not sure i'm not sure robin ever said that right but, but i know exactly where it came from we the new york we were a hit and the new york times sent a reporter and said could we hang out on the set and in the writer's room for a week and we said absolutely so he did and then he wrote that we wrote into the script mork does his thing here it's utterly untrue. It never happened. And it made me think maybe Vietnam never happened. I mean, I read the Times and they said it, it did, but 
So it was completely false. Now, Robin is and was a brilliant improviser. But the fact of the matter, as anyone, including you, who's seen him live knows, most of that improv is really dirty. I mean, he's grabbing his crotch and right. he's using every conceivable obscenity. And by the way, we would have nuns visit our set to watch the show, and they'd be in hysterics as Robin told the dirtiest con conceivable jokes. But anyway... Uh, he didn't outlive the show. He couldn't outlive the show. You can't do that on network television. There are other actors. They have lines to get through. So he would occasionally come up with a, a word or a, a, more importantly, he would come up with voices and faces. And the way he sold things was infinitely better than anyone else. So he gets all the credit, but he didn't write all the words. My line is that there were ten writers up till four in the morning every night writing his ad libs. <laughs> And again, I don't think Robin ever said that he outlived the show. Well, and I, right. And the thing is, I think over time, and it's, you know, it's strange yeah. to me now, thinking about it, that you don't see those repeats anywhere because they were quite funny. But, um, you know, maybe they played out years ago. I don't know. But the thing was, seeing him over the years, being Robin Williams for whatever it's been now, 35 years, I guess, yeah. um, it's, it's entirely believable that he did because he, he has continued to be that funny, that rapid fire. Although yeah. in recent years, he's he's slowed it down a little bit just to... Well, uh, a heart attack will do that to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, true. I mean, he was on uh, uh, Louis C.K.'s show recently, and he was I've playing, it, playing it. it down quite a yeah. bit. And, he was, and yeah. you know, it's still, you know, he's a funny guy. What are you going to do? So. One thing people would often ask me is, uh, is he like that in real life? And I, my honest answer was he is not like that all the time in real life. And I have had serious, I did have serious conversations with him, but he didn't enjoy serious conversations. He'd be having a serious conversation with you, and another comic would walk by, and it's like, boy, he gets to play. That's what he called it, playing. And that's where he would light up and really enjoy himself. Well, um, we, I want to I wanna tell people uh, where they can get your book. It is uh, Funny, the book, by David Mish. It's in great bookstores everywhere, or you can order it right now. Uh, at a great price at mrmedia.com. Right below this video, there is a link. Just click on it. You can get the book. It's right there. That's exactly where it is. Uh, no, no, that's something else, David. Your point. No, no, no. Stop oh. bringing attention to yourself. No, that's that's <laughs> very inappropriate. Now, the thing about the 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 uh, uh, the book is, uh, it's a very modern book in that it's full of uh, references to links uh, at uh, funnythebook.com, where if if uh, if you if David uh, talked about a uh, a Buster Keaton clip or uh, Marx Brothers or, or any number of things, there's dozens of these. Uh, you can you can follow along. He gives the number, and you can go to the website, and you can actually see the clip. So he keeps the book smaller by by sending you to the web. <laughs> Have I explained and it pretty well? You the consumer money. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, funnythebook.com. Are you on Twitter or Facebook? Any of those things? I am on Twitter and Facebook, t tweeting uh, amusing things since uh, like two months ago. Uh, one other thing, I should say that anyone who wants to rip me off uh, can go to funnythebook.com and get all those things for free. Uh, and in addition to the clips of great comedy scenes that I talk about in the book. There's uh, references to other things in the book, like when I talk about vaudeville, there's some fantastic sites on vaudeville that I link to on the website where you can see uh, videos of uh, great vaudeville acts from the 10s and 20s, amazing stuff, and uh, things to comedy in ancient Greece and all sorts of uh, things, and there's lots of uh, other media interviews with me, all inferior to this one, but still, they exist, you know. Thank you for acknowledging that publicly. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, David Mish, thank you so much for joining us today on Mr. Media. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows, get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. 
Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's The Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The Tech Crunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, BlackBerry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash mrmedia. That's stitcher.com slash mrmedia. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30-day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com, and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening.